Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our membership uh, only event. Um, my name is Harlow. Uh, I am our um, Chief Information Security Officer and Director of Digital Security. And I'm very, very pleased to be joined by my right hand, Martin Shelton. Why don't you go ahead? Martin Shelton, Principal Researcher. Uh, also work with Harlow on the Digital Security Training Team. Yeah. And today uh, we have a very special event um, in that uh, we are going to be giving you a somewhat modified version of the Digital Security 101 training that we've done with a number of newsrooms across the globe, as well as the training that we give to every member of Freedom of the Press Foundation uh, when they join us to start work. So, yeah, and this is, I think, the first event of hopefully very many um, for members. Uh, today we're doing 101. Um, in the future, we'll do things that are even more advanced, even like spicier um, and more fun. But uh, I think that it's a great way to get started with this membership program by making sure that everyone, um, all of you, uh, have you know the the what we consider like the gold standard, but also the baseline of digital security going forward. So um, I think we're going to give it a couple more minutes um, until uh, the rest of the crew comes in um, to, to join the stream. Um, and so I'll leave it to Ryan um, to let us know when we should begin. Hi, everybody. This is Ryan Rice, the membership coordinator at Freedom of the Press Foundation. I just want to thank everyone again for joining us, We're starting a little bit late to give people time to shuffle into the room, so to speak. Um, just as a reminder, I took this DigiSec 101 training. I'm excited to sit in again. There's always something uh, new that I pick up. So Harlow and Martin, whenever you guys are ready, uh, take it away. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, let's begin. Okay. All right. Let's get started. So welcome to Digital Security 101. And uh, yeah, we have like a pretty tight program for you. Uh, once again, a mildly abridged version of the one-on-one -on -one training that we've given to so many journalists, as well as our own staff. Um, yeah, this is the baseline that we want to establish to make sure that everybody has uh, an equal knowledge of digital security and most importantly, why it's important. But without further ado, let's um, do a little bit of an introduction. Uh, Martin, if you wouldn't mind. Sorry about that, folks. So I no, um, just wanted to, to say hi to folks who've uh, popped in more recently. Um, I'm Martin Shelton, Principal Researcher at Freedom of the Press. Um, I work with Harlow very closely. And also, uh, yeah, we are one part of a, uh, a multi-legged stool of different teammates, um, different teams working on lots of different projects. I'll hand it off to Harlow to talk about uh, some of those projects. Okay. All right. So, uh, as members, you probably already know about the work that we do, and so we're going to do just a very, very small introduction. Um, as Martin said, a multi-legged stool. I like to think of us as um, having three main pillars. One is what we do in software development, and uh, you might have heard of our flagship product, which is SecureDrop, a newsroom appliance that enables um, uh, encrypted and anonymous communication between the public at large, potential whistleblowers and sources, and a variety of newsrooms. Right here is where we kind of started. And actually, if you skip over to the next slide, you'll see the growing number of organizations that uh, we um, uh, have yeah, um, serviced uh, with SecureDrop as a project. And this is just one example of the uh, myriad uh, technological um, tools that we're putting into the hands of journalists and um, helping them learn how to use better to communicate with their sources. But also, the next pillar would be. We also have the US Press Freedom Tracker, um, which in coalition with multiple uh, press freedom organizations, uh, we help to keep track of press freedom violations across the US since 2017. Uh, this project has uh, made it possible for other media organizations as well to do accountability journalism on uh, on all matters of issues, including legal threats to journalists, 
uh, physical assaults, equipment damage. So there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, unfortunately <laughs> real need for this type of work uh, before we can get to advocate for individual cases of press freedom violations. And that brings us to. Uh, that brings us to us. Martin and I are um, at the helm of our digital security and training department, where um, in a, uh, this is just one taste of you know the work that we do um, in order to train journalists to use tools um, to their greatest effect uh, to promote the values of encryption and uh, privacy and um, uh, how to do this job as safely and effectively as possible through trainings like these um, uh, our own kind of press room, I think, that Martin runs with a lot of like primers and tutorials, um, as well as uh, a, a modest con uh, security consultancy um, uh, project where we work with newsrooms in order to like bolster their security posture. We're pretty proud of it. Oh. Yep, here we go. Okay, but now introductions over. Um, let's talk about um, the fundamentals, and this always starts out with a risk assessment. So go ahead, Martin, you take it from here. Yeah, the topic number one, always, always, always a risk assessment. Um, before we talk about some of the different tools and practices want to begin to figure out how to think about security as uh, a sort of mindset. Um, now, this, the risk assessment is just the idea of trying to figure out what specifically you're concerned about and what you could do about it. Um, so this also introduces some questions about uh, your capacity, some of the things that you have as your superpowers to be able to uh, address some of your own needs. So what are, um, you know, who are you? Uh, what do you care about? So those, those gets into, uh, those issues get into some questions around assets. So what are the specific things that you wanna protect? Um, and then what resources do you have to begin to protect them? Um, this brings us to another question around, um, what are you concerned about? Who specifically are you concerned about? Um, say, for example, are you, if, you know, we make these kinds of decisions all the time when it comes to things like, you know, locking your bike somewhere. Um, I'm concerned about a bike thief stealing my bike. And then you begin to map out how likely is that? Um, what are some of people's capabilities when it comes to taking my bike. Um, and this varies depending on context, right? If you're in uh, a neighborhood where we keep seeing these bikes getting stolen, <laughs> that kind of makes you wonder, hmm, I don't know if I want to park my bike here specifically. So next question then becomes, all right, well, what can you do about it? Um, there's a number of things that you could do in this example. Um, it could be you know, a matter of parking your bike somewhere else locking it in a secured storage area and you know this is like the uh, the i think in the digital security world this might be uh, things like talking about authentication practices and um, some of the different types of tools that we can use uh, in order to better protect ourselves from uh, the alternative possibly uh, less strong posture so we'll get into what specifically that means but uh, you know we do have to begin to also be honest with ourselves that we're in a moment of extraordinary political volatility. And this makes it a little bit more difficult to know exactly how to map all of this out. So, you know, let's be kind to ourselves a little bit about that. Um, but let's uh, start with some of the different types of uh, groups that are out there that we might want to be concerned about. Um, so one group that unfortunately is uh, extremely, extremely common on the internet uh, is people who want to make journalists' lives harder because they are, um, for either for their identity or in response to their reporting. Um, and so, you know, this uh, this troll uh, act, this troll actor might be uh, just one person. Uh, sometimes it's a group of people, uh, but they are essentially. Uh, they just have lots and lots of time on their hands. And that's the resource that they have um, in order to uh, pull off their attack. So tech, uh, the technical skill tends to be a little bit lower. Sometimes they do have some uh, some hacking uh, techniques, but uh, more often than not, it's just uh, it's about harassment. And uh, sometimes this includes um, 
even slight technical attacks like uh, beginning to roll out phishing pages. And some of this can be fairly well automated nowadays. Uh, but then you have uh, things that are a little bit scarier. Um, so three letter agencies and actually um, at Freedom of the Press Foundation, we have definitely dealt with a number of investigative units for whom this was an adversary that they were mostly worried about within their threat model or within their risk assessment. And unlike the troll, um, you, well, every adversary is going to have a, a certain amount of time they can spend, money they can spend and technical skill. Unlike the troll, obviously a uh, three letter agency, intelligence agency, no matter where, um, has a lot of money, um, has a lot of skill. Um, uh, in addition to expertise that they have in house, they would also probably leverage that of um, external uh, contractors. And they definitely do have a lot of time um, on, uh, in order to uh, follow an investigation until they feel like they've sufficiently um, and satisfactorily like gotten to the bottom of it. Um, so uh, when Martin actually brought up the question of likelihood, while it is definitely possible that um, you might uh, run afoul or you know, just be targeted by an intelligence apparatus, um, it's not necessarily certain that um, that is going to be within your threat model. And so this is an adversary to think about. However, if that is not likely to be the adversary that you're going to come up against, um, we encourage people to just calm down a little bit and consider some of the more likely adversaries like the next one, Martin. So one of the more likely groups, uh we often think about as uh, you know law enforcement who also happen to have a lot of overlapping capacity uh, with both at the local and federal level because sometimes they work together um, also thinking about uh, fusion centers as one of the kind of growing concerns for uh, both local local and federal law enforcement a lot of data sharing between departments um, they tend to lean on the legal system in order to get access to your uh, your assets, so this could include things like uh, you know sending a subpoena to a phone company in order to find out uh, who you spoke to, and this unfortunately is uh, extremely common, uh, far more than we would like it to be. And then um, there is the corporate figure. And actually, there's a lot of excellent reporting about this particular adversary. Uh, they have a little bit less time um, than an intelligence agency. They usually do have a lot of money. Um, and they tend to outsource their, their, tech, their lack of technical skill. Um, they outsource that to uh, independent um, uh, contractors, such as private investigators, hacking teams, you know, um, anything that money can buy in order to ultimately like perform a large amount of surveillance, sometimes even harassment. And what's scary about the corporate figure is that unlike law enforcement and even unlike to a certain extent, Mm, your mileage may vary, an intelligence agency, the uh, corporate adversary is unique in that um, they're not restricted by, you know, uh, uh, having to have a judge sign off on a subpoena or a warrant, um, which depending on the country that um, you're uh, being, you know, targeted by, um, actually like does provide like a certain amount of or at least like idealistically uh, of checks and balances that prevent you know, um, certain types of surveillance from being overly used. Uh, the corporate figure is untethered by any of these means, but yet they still kind of resort to a lot of the same tactics and they definitely have the same amount of money. So that's scary. Yeah. But what's next? We also have the, uh, just hackers, uh, folks who, uh, individually, you know, might have a little money or a lot of money, it's, uh, but the main th the main asset that they have is exper expertise. Um, so these are people who are uh, either well positioned to pull off different types of social engineering attacks, literally like picking up a phone and tricking somebody into giving them access to things that they uh, uh, are not entitled to. Um, this can also include more technical attacks and. Um, Sometimes, you know, folks who have these skills, they sometimes have both um, and 
can chain them together to, to kind of snake their way into your networks. Um, so there's, uh, compared to say a law enforcement or intelligence group, uh, these tend not to have any sort of legal capacity. Um, although we have been hearing about a growing number of cases where uh, people sometimes also try to social engineer uh, police departments in order to get access to information to which they're also not entitled through the legal system. So that's interesting. Um, but this is all just to say that uh, there's a lot of different uh, issues at work here and things are really changing quickly. Uh, thinking about our political system uh, uh, for the past week, I've certainly been giving a lot of thought to um, well, how does this change threat models for some of the journalism uh, around uh, specific reproductive rights issues? Um, or say, you know, we're thinking more recently about uh, uh, wars unfolding across the world. How does that affect threat models for journalists in various countries around the world? So this is something that we just have to be honest, that we have to be very dynamic and adaptable to some of the different changing risk assessments that we are going to be working with people on. Um, that said, we also know that uh, the vast majority of the time, a lot of these attacks, they uh, at least the technical attacks, uh, they tend to look kind of the same. They tend to be about account breaches. Uh, each year, the uh, Verizon they release this uh, database invest uh, or data breach investigations report, which unpacks different types of digital attacks, and they tend to mostly be uh, focused around uh, account hijacking. And there's a few different ways that that happens. Um, but this prompts the question of uh, making sure that we don't reuse the same password everywhere. Um, whenever a password is reused on one, on one website and it's breached, um, now hackers, they're passing that password around. And this allows them to basically try out that password on every website that they have access to. Um, or that they think their target might be using. Uh, if you happen to reuse the same password, that creates a tremendous vulnerability for all of your online presence. So this is why we tend to think about uh, generating and storing unique passwords for everything. At the same time, this also introduces uh, a separate issue of, well, I don't really want to remember all of those passwords. <laughs> um, this is why people reuse their password. It's something that they can remember. Um, now, uh, we have some solutions for that. Um, piece of software called a password manager is really helpful on this front. Um, services like 1Password or Bitwarden are online uh, password managers that essentially what they have, what they're doing is they allow you to store, uh, randomly generate and store securely all of your passwords behind a secured vault. Uh, it's an encrypted vault. and this uh, essentially prevents the service provider from being able to read uh, those passwords. Only you can read them and you have to have the right authentication to get in. Uh, so this means that you only have to remember one password in order to access all of these randomly, uh, random uniquely generated passwords. There's also offline ones if you don't feel more comfortable with that. Um, KeyPass XE is the one that we tend to point to. Um, the one password uh, we use 1Password at Freedom of the Press Foundation. Um, it's also something that is really great for journalists because they have a 1Password for journalism program, so free subscriptions for uh, anybody working in media. Um, but here's generally how this works. So when you are uh, when you're signing up for a web page or perhaps changing your password, oops, let's see if we can get that playing. Um, then the password manager, maybe it's uh, in your browser or it's an app on your phone, it will allow you to randomly generate this password here. And maybe you want it to be more of a human readable, memorable password. It might be something like this. You can change the format of it to whatever you like. You can directly edit the password if you like as well. But then you can auto fill it from there. And now, you have the option to save that into your password manager. Now, what you just saw there was the password manager autofilling within the browser. This means that anytime that you are going 
that you're filling out something in a pass with a password manager. Um, from now on, you actually don't have to type in that password. You can just use the password manager. It will automatically fill it out on websites and applications that you use. Uh, this also ends up being a real time saver because now you don't have to type something in and then there's a typo and then you have to type it in again. <laughs> uh, no more of that, just uh, automatically fill everything out. And that's not only more secure than um, reusing the password, but also I think a little bit more convenient. Um, so this also begs the question, what about the password for the password manager? Well, that password needs to be really good because everything, all of your other passwords are protected by it. Um, we tend to recommend passphrases. Um, now, passphrases are really great because they, uh, they're they harder to guess. Um, if you have a short password, it can typically be cracked a little bit more easily than say a passphrase. So here's an example of that. Um, password one, two, three, by the way, so this is a password checker from Kaspersky. Do not actually put your password into one of these password checkers, um, but just for the sake of example, uh, this password is password one, two, three, and it can be cracked almost immediately. Now, why is that? The reason why this can be cracked almost immediately is because a password like this has been leaked a whole bunch of times in the past and added to password lists that uh, attackers and uh, security professionals, they like to aggregate these big lists of passwords, uh, commonly used passwords, and then all of the most common ones go directly to the top of that list. Uh, so this must be a very common password. Uh, and then, you know, when they're iterating through these passwords to see which ones work on a website, uh, you're going to get a, a hit very quickly. Compare this to a randomly generated passphrase, Groovy, Puzzle, Monorail, Grooving, Turkey. Um, this would be very unlikely to be near the top of that password list. Um, so that's just to say more random is better, um, longer is better, uh, passphrases are also uh, a little bit better than our passwords. Now, if you're going to create a password for that password manager, uh, ideally that should really contain four or more random words. Um, you can even create it with the password manager if you like. Um, and you could store it somewhere in your home, um, maybe written down somewhere hidden in your home or a place that you trust, um, memorize it. Um, or even if you have another password manager, um, that's another way to store these things. But uh, I personally like to write down um, any password that I need to memorize. I keep it in my wallet um, just in case I need to pull it out for some reason and keep doing that until I memorize it. And then once it's in my head, get rid of that uh, piece of paper. That's what I like to do. But everybody's different. Um, that's just to say, you know, uh, try to fit, try to get that uh, randomized password that is unique and then use that for your password manager. We also have a guide here. Um, I believe Harlow put this together um, around different types of passphrases. Um, and so yeah, we've got a link here for that. We'll share a lot of these resources later as well. Let's talk about yeah. phishing. Okay, this is kind of my favorite. Um, this is usually something that we do as a game, but given the format that we have uh, this afternoon, um, we're just gonna just go through like the highlights of it and I'll walk you through it. So phishing and spear phishing. Um, sometimes you might've noticed uh, getting a weird email asking you to, you know, like uh, purchase some gift cards or something from your boss, but it wasn't. Um, or you might wonder if a person that you've been corresponding with over email for a while um, actually is trying to, you know, like infiltrate your entire digital life. Anyways, um, from the most mundane where it's just about how much money they can milk out of someone. Once again, if you're thinking about your threat model, that is an adversary who does not have too much time, doesn't have too much money because they want yours, and doesn't have very much skill because it's usually really hilariously uh, clumsy the way that they do that. Um, but then their spear phishing is, uh, represents a higher adversary. And so we're gonna walk through like these different um, types, but ultimately, Regardless, um, 
phishing is a social engineering attack, meaning that it is an attack that leverages your human ability to trust. Um, and it's crafted in order to get you to do one of at least three things, such as hand over your credentials, such as your you know passwords, things like that. Download and install malware, which um, gives someone permanent access to any of your devices, or um, especially in the case of more advanced spear phishing attacks, get you to divulge confidential information such as, you know, um, who uh, at your organization, you know, do, is responsible for such and such a thing, or, um, you know, what your organization um, might be doing that isn't particularly public, uh, things like that. So trust games. And we're going to be focusing on email-based phishing attacks. However, I do want everyone to know that the same things come through via you know, text messages, WhatsApp, even Signal. And we're gonna talk about that. So there's absolutely no place where you can be reached that will keep you safe from a phishing attack, but we're focusing on email here. All right, let's have a look. Okay. This is a game that we like to call spot the fish, where sometimes it's easy, but it gets trickier and trickier. Okay. So I like this one. Okay, this is a true story. They're all true stories, um, uh, spooky stories. Uh, in 2016, uh, a lawyer working for an Egyptian um, NGO was arrested. She was actually arrested, detained, brought to the station. And just as that happened, uh, an email got sent out to just about every one of her professional contacts. They all received the same email. And we can see um, on the next slide what that looked like. So this is a very clumsy phishing lure um, that was actually paid for um, as part of an operation um, by the Egyptian government in order to weave its way through um, this particular lawyer's social, or, uh, professional network with the aims of installing malware or um, harvesting credentials, meaning getting passwords to accounts. This was the email that a lot of these people received. And um, we usually at this point like everybody to unmute themselves and say, uh, you know, what sticks out to them as being, you know, fishy. But I'm going to save us the trouble right here. And I'm going to go through some things. So one, if you look at who it's from, uh, it is from an uh, email address, dropbox.noreplay at gmail.com. And why we know that that's fishy uh, is because obviously Gmail is a um, service one that has nothing to do with Dropbox, right? They're competitors. So why would um, Dropbox have a Gmail account? Also, Gmail is a platform that anyone on the planet can sign up for for free. Um, there's a typo. It sometimes should be dropbox.no reply, but here it's no replay. And was that an accidental typo? Or probably it's because some other scammer got to dropbox.no reply first and they, you know, did the best that they can. Um, ultimately, it's really ugly. Uh, it looks super duper clumsy. Uh, I don't speak Arabic, but I was told that uh, that is not even a legitimate file name for something that would contain an arrest warrant. So there's all sorts of um, red flags that should have popped up in anyone's brain. However, if you did click on that view file link, you would have been brought to what we see on our next slide, which is a, um, this is what's called a credential harvesting page, where simply they're just asking for, you know, your username and your password for what appears to be not a Dropbox account, but actually a Gmail account and a Google account. Um, you'll notice that, or if you recall what Google looked like in 2016, this is kind of that look. Um, and so you have to ask yourself, why would um, you'd be signing on to Dropbox via Google? Uh, because once again, they're competing, or competing um, entities. And also, most importantly, is what you see in the address bar, which is a URL. I'm sorry, I'm leaning in and squinting here because it's a little bit tiny, uh, but it says dropboxsupport.servehttp.com. So there's a couple of things that are interesting about that. Um, one is that obviously if you were on Dropbox, you would be on the domain dropbox.com. 
And what this attacker did is they used what are called subdomains in order to possibly obfuscate the fact that uh, instead of going to dropbox.com, you are being directed to servehttp.com. And there was a subdomain that if you weren't paying attention, um, given that it's like, you know, towards the beginning of what we read, uh, would possibly trick you into believing that you were on a Dropbox site. So subdomains um, can be created by the owner of any website at their whim. Um, it doesn't really matter. I can call it anything I want to. And in this case, they uh, chose something with the Dropbox name in it in order to abuse someone's trust if they weren't paying attention. Um, another thing that is interesting here uh, is that in the year 2016, this particular phishing attack did not um, apply uh, any kind of encryption, and Martin's going to talk about that very, very soon, but there's no encryption on this particular website. And even back then, we still know that logging into a, um, a site that is not encrypted, that does not have that lock in the uh, address bar and does not begin with HTTPS, that actually is a huge red flag. Um, it shows that this is a really sloppy fish uh, but also, um, it means that for re uh, reasons we'll get into a little bit later, that particular web page can't even be trusted to safeguard your precious username and password as you enter it, uh, because it is unencrypted. So these are a couple of really big glaring red flags. So that was an easy one. And I don't think that it worked very well. But it does get trickier. And we can look at the next one. So this is one example um, of a um, Iranian uh, operation a couple of years later that leveraged the fact that a lot of human rights activists within that region were um, really, really conscious about encryption. And as such, they started to take to um, email platforms like what we see here, Tutanota, um, which is really great. It's great. Um, however, uh, what they did was in, they bought the domain tutanota.org, whereas the real email provider is tutanota.com. So this was actually really devastating uh, because, you know, if you are targeting a bunch of activists and uh, they're presented with a dot org address, they actually do tend to trust it. And they thought that they were at, um, accessing their legitimate Tutanota email accounts by um, visiting this particular phishing lore. Um, and also you'll notice that we do have a green lock. So it is encrypted. We do have HTTPS. And so you can't necessarily take for granted that a, um, a phishing lore is going to be unencrypted and sloppy. Um, this is actually really clever. I probably could have gotten got by this very, very one had I not known that Tutanota was only at tutanota.com. What's next? Uh, this is from that same campaign. Uh, in addition to Tutanota, we also have the more popular ProtonMail, both of which end-to-end -end encrypted, super secure email systems, caveats galore, but still they're great. Um, but this one actually shows ProtonMail if you dig in a little bit closer, you'll notice that uh, ProtonMail is actually misspelled a little bit. Um, we call this, both of these examples are, are what we call typo squatting, which means that either uh, because of a minute misspelling or because uh, you registered the same domain on another um, registrar, so like the .com, org instead of the legitimate .com, for whatever reason, um, you are confusing the human being uh, by um, getting them to visit the wrong page. And uh, if it's credible looking enough, both of which are incredible examples of very convincing facsimiles of the original, if you put in the work, you can actually get people to leave their credentials and ultimately um, give hand over access to their accounts to an attacker. Yeah, scary. This is my favorite. This one actually happened to me. This is my own email. It's my favorite. 
I still have that email. I'm very fond of it. Um, uh, I was working at a um, uh, an, an engineering um, project where uh, we were all sent an email, um, just you know, a normal like Google Play Store email, um, asking us to log into the account um, that actually managed our uh, the repositories, the apps that we had in the Play Store from uh, google.com.de. Another really excellent example of typo squatting, it's highlighted there. Uh, and actually, uh, I'll cut to the chase because the next slide kind of shows exactly what we're looking at here, um, which is that there were three O's. And given the fact that like Google has like the G and then another G and then there's the O's, I got that email um, on a Friday uh, during happy hour. I was having a beer and quite frankly, I, I mean, I do have a rule about <laughs> not going into developer mode when I'm at a happy hour, but ultimately uh, in addition to typo squatting, we also saw an attack that leveraged um, real life patterns patterns of people's lives um, that could be leveraged in order to um, uh, successfully complete this particular exploit, this particular attack. Um, for me, it's a happy hour. For those NGO workers, it was the absolutely real arrest of their colleague. All of these things throw you into a headspace where it's hard to make the right decisions. So yeah. Um, this one is pretty infamous, and had this one not occurred, we would be living in a different world today. Um, this is uh, what happened to John Podesta. Uh, it looks like a very credible um, uh, a Google reset my password email that you might get because someone had, uh, yeah, uh, tried to get into your account and Google is trying to notify you. Um, from any uh, or to the naked eye, this looks entirely credible. And um, when we give this phishing drill, we don't necessarily uh, expect people to understand exactly why this is so suspicious and why this one particular phishing email pretty much changed the trajectory of American history. But if we go to the next slide, we can show you. So, um, you might have noticed in the previous slide there was a um, but or there was an icon that says change password. Um, one might have clicked on that uh, and not noticed that instead of going to you know uh, one's Google account, etc., where you might manage your account details, it actually goes to. I hope you can see this. It's a little bit small, but it goes to. Uh, a bit.ly link, which is a link shortener, a very popular link shortener um, that could um, mask the actual origin of any particular link that you might visit. So uh, that means that uh, rather than going directly to Google, um, this bit.ly link was actually mapped to a malicious site, which then harvested a password and then was used uh, in order to uh, gain access to an account by on behalf of that attacker. Um, yeah, and so what to do in that case? Of course, uh, you could hover over a particular link in order to see exactly what address it was going to. Um, or if you're on mobile, you would long press until that little bubble pops up, which shows you exactly like the link that you're supposed to head on to. Um, however, all of these things are imperfect. Once again, um, uh, we as humans are only going to be right half of the time. Um, and so we have a couple of more foolproof measures uh, that we'd like to just kind of call your attention to rather than going through all of this like forensic analysis of uh, every single email that crosses your inbox. There are better ways. So to recap, we saw a lot of typos, bad grammar. We saw really crappily like constructed pages that are so ugly that it's laughable. Okay, fine. That's the easy stuff. URLs that have absolutely no connection to the service, like this bit.ly link or that errant um, Dropbox um, serve HTTP um, kerfuffle that we saw. Uh, we saw unsolicited attachments, and we also saw social pressure in combination with the actual exploit. Okay, once again, these are the forensics of it. It makes a great story to tell, but 
um, daily, what we should be mindful of is what keeps us most protected, which is on our next slide there. Don't try to be as vigilant as that. And instead just open it. Like if you get an email and it's like, oh, you know, you should change your password. Someone's got your password, you know, like eh, click on this, blah, blah, blah. Just ignore that. Take a deep breath. Um, open up a new tab, new browser, window, whatever you want to do. Manually type in google.com where you are signed in. Um, because ultimately when you go to your Google account page, there will be a notification in the top right-hand corner that probably will point you directly to anything that needs, be, uh, that needs to be taken care of um, if there's something to be taken care of. And if there's not, then you know just forget about it. And that's pretty much the best thing that you can do to keep yourself safe. Um, another thing that actually does protect um, against these types of attacks, for the most part, um, is just applying two-factor authentication. Um, it's one of the most effective ways to uh, keep accounts safe. And uh, two-factor authentication is based off of the idea that you have, um, in order to authenticate to a service, you have something that you know, or rather something that your password manager knows, which is that passphrase, and then something that you have, which is usually, you know, like physical um, uh, possession of a uh, mobile device or some sort of device. And this is usually like this, your, your mobile phone, sometimes you get text messages, or perhaps you're using an app, we're going to talk about this in a moment. Um, or perhaps you have something really cool like a security key, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. But either of these things um, increase your security way more against these um, phishing attacks in the wild. Um, for uh, Google, this is like the easiest thing to set up. They've put in a lot of work to make sure that that workflow works for you. Um, uh, you simply uh, just uh, at first give it your phone number. A lot of people do have like qualms about that, but that is a necessity for the first time when you set up two-factor authentication. You're able to remove that, you know, once you've gotten that out of the way. Um, but you add your um, uh, you add your uh, phone number. You receive a six-digit code from Google, and then you place that back into your uh, the workflow on Google where you are signed in in order to complete that step. That's pretty much it. But um, it doesn't stop with Google. Uh, if you go to one of our favorite links ever, um, it's 2fa.directory. Uh, this is a clearinghouse for all of the ways where you might receive two-factor authentication. And you can browse it um, by various categories, or you can simply just search for the type of uh, two-factor, uh, or sorry, the type of service that you want to apply two-factor authentication to. And let's say you, you know, search for Google or something like that, um, the search results, which we'll see uh, in the next slide, um, is actually really fine grained in a way that we really appreciate. So uh, you'll notice that, let, let's look at, you know, uh, in comparison, your Adobe like cloud account or whatever and Gmail. First off, you have a column that shows the documentation, which is where on the official Adobe or Google or whatever services site where you have that um, available. Um, but then all of the, the following um, uh, columns show you exactly how to enable two-factor authentication. And quite frankly, there are, I mean, two-factor is great however you can get it, but that said, they're best, the best ways to uh, get your second factor are with the ones towards the end, such as the hardware token and the software token. Um, and so we want to prioritize using the software token and the hardware token wherever possible. Um, if SMS messages, which are plain old text messages, is your only recourse, go ahead and enable it. But if you have a choice, go for those software token or hardware token for both. And what does that mean when we say that? Um, so first and foremost, this is why we don't like SMS-based two-factor authentication. Um, this is an old story, uh, but I do think that it's worth telling. Um, Black Lives Matter activist Duray McKesson back in, I think it was 2016 as well, also um, was 
uh, prone to a very, very um, effective and horrible attack on his personal accounts um, because uh, an attacker was able to uh, confuse, socially engineer his uh, um, phone company uh, to assign his phone number, which they found out by like Googling, you know, information about him on the internet, um, assign his phone number to a phone that they then controlled. And so all of the things that you'd receive via text messages that are supposed to keep you safer, such as, you know, um, your two-factor authentication code, or I forgot my password, like help me, you know, like things like that, all of those backups um, coming in through two-factor authentication were no longer in his hands, in DeRay's hands, but in the hands of attackers. And they used that to get into his Gmail accounts, his you know, Twitter account, all of those things. Um, and so this is a, a, a tactic that's called SIM jacking. Um, if you do want to protect yourself from that, the best thing that you can do is also apply the same amount of protection to your phone, uh, uh, your, your mobile carrier's account. Call them up. Um, set a pin on your uh, on your uh, account. Um, I've gone through that a couple of times, actually, in the past couple of days. And, you know, I mean, uh, despite the fact that it's more security, I feel a lot co more comfortable and more confident um, about the security of my phone number um, and my possession of it having done that. But I also feel way more secure in the um, uh, in my ability to to keep a handle on my you know Twitter and my Google account and my Slack account and like all those things by applying healthy two factor authentication with something other than text messages. So yeah, so software token. What we're talking about when we mean software token is an app. Uh, that you keep on your phone. So for example, Google Authenticator is one. Um, uh, what it does is it actually keeps these codes that you need rather than receiving them via text messages when you need them. Um, they're always on your device. You pop open that app and there those codes are. And what's cool about that is you actually, once you've set it up, uh, you never need to, you know, receive a text message. And so not only does that protect you from like that really scary bit that I mentioned about SIM jacking, but also it protects you in uh, the case where uh, service isn't available. So for instance, I'm actually traveling internationally right now. I don't really want to rely upon receiving a text message if I'm in a place where I have very low connectivity or um, it'll incur such charges that um, I will really, really be upset when I get my phone bill. So like there's um, a, a couple of great benefits to having um, an app on your phone take care of that same second factor. And what else do we have? Oh, the hardware token. Uh, this is actually the most secure. Um, the absolute most secure way that you can receive your second factor is to have a um, security key that you just either plug into your uh, computer or you tap to the back of your phone or plug it into your phone, however you want to do it, whichever one that you ultimately do buy, um, in order to uh, with just a tap, deliver that second factor directly to the website that you're trying to authenticate to. And what we like about the physical tokens, the hardware tokens, is that um, you cannot actually deliver the code successfully to, um, let's say, a Google with three O's dot C-O dot D-E. You can't do that because this hardware token does not recognize a false site as um, uh, a site to negotiate with. It will just ignore it. It will not be able to spit out um, the code because uh, it, the hardware itself recognizes only a legitimate site. So this is the best way to protect yourself from any kind of phishing attack. So I think we can recap here. If you like SpongeBob, <laughs> you'll see that, uh, yeah, the two-factor via SMS, it's okay if that's your only option. Cool, but if you wanna do it even better, get yourself an app such as Google Authenticator, such as Authy, such as actually one of the password managers that we really like a lot, 1Password, they also have two-factor authentication functionality built in. So, you know, you can do that if you'd like. However, 
if you really want that champion um, protection, you definitely uh, should invest in a YubiKey, that hardware token. Martin, off to you. Cool. So let's talk about another topic, uh, safer web browsing. Uh, so traditionally, you might be thinking about websites and your visits to websites as, uh, you know, it's a kind of one-to-one -one relip. This is our very simple model. I like to log into google.com to search for something. But in reality, it's probably a little bit more like this. We have a lot of intermediaries that might include, uh, say, if you're at an airport or a cafe, there's a uh, the Wi-Fi operator that might have access to some of the traffic, the internet service provider, number of intermediaries along the way. Um, and this is our slightly or slightly more complex and we'll keep building this out model. But um, that's just to say, you know, now we have to start thinking about what are those interme intermediaries able to see along the way uh, while I'm browsing the web. So Harlow mentioned this a little bit earlier. Uh, if you are on an unencrypted website, that is a HTTP website, that's an unsecured connection. And that's that anybody along the way, including those inter intermediaries, are able to then see the traffic, that they're able to see the things that you type in. Um, this is not really what we want. Now, the good news is, especially in recent years, we've seen a lot more adoption of uh, HTTPS encryption uh, to make sure that any of your connections to the web are properly secured. So you type things in, those intermediaries can't see them. The, uh, the service provider can still see the things that you're typing in though. Uh, so that's just to say, you know, if uh, it kind of build this model out even more, uh, if you are using a, you know, a text messaging app, or sending DMs over Twitter, the service provider can still read the things that you're putting in just fine. Um, and in fact, what this means is, you know, if you're sending something to your friend, uh, the way that we really want to be thinking about this is that you are having a secured connection with the service provider and that the service provider then relays things to your friend. So they can really have access to anything that uh, you're sending to your friend. It's also important to remember that uh, because the service provider is able to read the things that you send to them, uh, they might be forced to hand it over in case they receive a valid legal request. Uh, lawful interception is an issue. There's also the not so lawful interception. <laughs> uh, thinking about, we were talking about earlier phishing attacks and uh, different types of ways that somebody might try to get at your data. That is also an issue. And then, of course, there's also insider threats. Um, I won't get into any of the examples of this here, um, but there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ways in which companies uh, over the years either they might have failed to uh, uh, either failed to create proper processes for people to uh, access only the user data to which they're entitled, or uh, sometimes they actually have a culture of enabling that user data access in really permissive ways, um, which is very unfortunate, but that does happen. And so uh, there's, you know, and sometimes also thinking about um, cases of corporate espionage, people are actively looking for access that they are uh, not entitled to. And so that means that the company, if they uh, have not properly locked everything down internally, um, that that data can also be up for grabs. So that's something to be aware of. Um, so just to kind of recap, we really like HTTP, uh, HTTPS um, over HTTP. Um, I also want to flag that, uh, you know, there's uh, that there's more to this. So whenever you connect to that website, um, say that you're in Los Angeles and you're connecting to uh, the New York Times, well, you're uh, in our simplified model, the New York Times now sees your IP address. Now, they have the server is going to create a log of that IP address. Um, this can be roughly approximated to a location. Um, and the website, depending on how they choose to use uh, this, inf this information that they now have access to, 
maybe they have uh, analytics uh, uh, services on their website. Maybe they have other types of uh, logging functionality. Um, we see this a lot with media organizations that are kind of excited to figure out, all right, who's connecting to us? What stories are they uh, interested in? Uh, so they can get, uh, they can turn that IP address into some information about a rough location. This might change over time. It's important to note. Uh, but if you want to look that up, you can always look for your own IP within a search engine. Uh, just say, what is my IP? They will typically service it very quickly. And they service, this uh, service DBIP is one example of many where you're able to punch in that IP address, see where that roughly maps to. Um, the IP address might change over time. It's important to not think of this as a an IP that's just there forever, unchanging, immutable. Uh, no, it's, they tend to, to rotate every now and again, but depending on the density of how many devices happen to be uh, in a given location, those IP addresses uh, might be mappable to a fairly small area like a street, or maybe it's a much larger area like, uh, like a city. So this also makes, uh, this brings us to VPNs and some of the different uses for them. Uh, with a VPN, you can change your IP, which is kind of nice for a bunch of different reasons. So the way that this works is uh, with the VPN, you can, uh, you're connecting through the service provider, which then relays all of your traffic to your final destination. So in this case, if you connected to the New York Times, this means that the New York Times is going to see that you are connecting from a server somewhere else, perhaps uh, it's in Germany, it could be anywhere really. Uh, because you're connecting through this remote server, you're going to look like you are coming from that location. And this could have some, uh, at times, funny effects where, say, the website sees that you're coming from a given country, they might serve you a different language uh, that's responsive to that country's official language. Um, so, you know, it's always something to be aware of. Uh, but most VPN providers are going to let you choose where you want to connect from. Often they have uh, dozens, sometimes even, uh, sometimes uh, uh, server, dozens of servers per country. Sometimes they have uh, multiple countries. So that's a, that gives you a lot of flexibility about what place you want to connect from. Uh, but it is really, really important, and we do always stress this when we're talking to journalists, uh, that you really want to pay for <laughs> a VPN. Uh, you don't want to use a free unpaid service because typically those also uh, need to make their money somewhere and it might be by logging your data. So what you really want is a no log paid service uh, that we also have some links for. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, again, the VPN provider has the full ability to record as much about your online activities as say the internet service provider normally would uh, or it could be compelled to. So you really have to trust them. You really want to pay for a good VPN with no logging. Uh, our good friend Yael Grauer has put together a list with Wirecutter um, and also with help from our friend uh, and colleague, David Huerta, uh, who also wrote a separate uh, piece on our website. And we have a link to that. We'll share all these links. Uh, but there's these, these recommendations, they change routinely. So um, yeah, these are nice links to come back to every now and again. Let's talk about browser safety. All right, yes, let's. Okay, so now um, all of this stuff is really great, but every day we're, you know, just interfacing with the internet primarily through our browsers. Um, and so we're going to just give you a couple of tips about to lock down Chrome and Firefox, things to look out for um, to make you a little bit more secure. Um, uh, yeah, uh, as you're doing your day to day. All right, what do we got? So first and foremost, there are things like browser history and um, definitely like think about um, the events that have transpired in the United States over the past couple of weeks, culminating in what happened um, last week, uh, the end of Roe v. Wade and the possibility of criminalizing, uh, you know, uh, uh, people who are seeking 
um, abortion, who are seeking advice, who are seeking anything, and having things like um, you know their uh, housing history or something like that possibly fall into the hands and or of um, you know uh, people who are trying to uh, uh, bring them you know to trial based off of like actions that they've done. So like these are not. Um, uh, these are not threats that are like unimaginable, especially now. And it's always been this way, but the, it, recent events have definitely put that into relief and like, not hopefully, but like perhaps given this a little bit more urgency. So that said, um, definitely understand that browser history is a thing. Learn where in your browser of choice, your browser history is contained and learn how to selectively clear it wherever you feel that is appropriate. We can't really tell you when or like, you know, set a schedule for you because it definitely depends on how you use your computers. Um, but just know that this is an option that you should avail yourself to. Also be selective about things like autofill where you're going to keep your passwords because also we told you about password managers and so perhaps you don't want to keep copies of your passwords in your browser um, as well as in your password manager that is like a redundancy um, and you want to minimize as much data that's kept in different silos as much as possible. Um, there are certain websites that are crafted just to look at what you might offer via autofill in order to um, uh, get information about your credit cards, about addresses, about things like that. So be very selective about where you put that. Okay. Next, um, let's talk about trackers and ads. Uh, in addition to being really ugly and uh, slowing down your performance, um, Obviously, we live in an era of surveillance capitalism where our data is gold. And so you do want to take control of who gets your data by um, applying an, uh, an ad blocker and also like a, an, a tracker blocker. We recommend uh, EFF Electronic Frontier Foundation, our cousins, uh, Privacy Badger, which is an extension that you can install in most browsers um, with the exception of Safari at this point in order to um, minimize your exposure to trackers across the web. So have a look at Privacy Badger. And that can also be used in combination with an ad blocker. Um, and these work slightly differently. We're not going to get into the minutia um, because we have so much more to talk about. Uh, but we recommend something like uBlock Origin, which is great, or even Ghostery, which you know is pretty good too, um, in order to get rid of those ads. And I know like when you're, you know, sometimes when you're reading a news article, you might, and you have an ad blocker on, you might get a pop-up that says, we notice you're using an ad blocker. We can't let you read this article. And if that article is really worth reading, you can always say, okay, I'm going to drop those shields and allow the ads to run on this article that I really, really want to read. And I'm supporting journalism by giving data to the ad monsters. You can make that choice, but just know that you do have that choice. And by default, maybe, you want, I'm sorry, there's a dog here, it's adorable. Um, maybe you you just, you know, want to just keep that choice in mind. Okay. Um, finally, another extension that we can't recommend enough um, is something called HTTPS Everywhere, also created by the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And simply what it does is make sure that you always have that encrypted version of the uh, website that you're visiting and also any like little bits of that website, such as, um, you know, like uh, the, um, the images, you know, other little bits that make the website look and feel the way that it does. Make sure that it's all encrypted because as Martin uh, kind of pinpointed before, when the web is unencrypted, um, you can be surveilled or you can have your connection tampered with. And so this eliminates that threat. And this is a pro tip. Um, you can actually make sure that all of these extensions are available in uh, not only in your normal browsing experience, but also in incognito mode or private browsing mode, depending on, you know, what browser you're using, they're going to call it different things. And this is great because you can have the minimal, but still legitimate protection of private browsing mode. Uh, but then you can also have these shields extensions uh, uh, at your service in order to um, offer and extend even more protection.
And it takes just like a little toggle um, in your settings where you have those extensions installed. Just make sure you toggle. Also make this available in incognito mode. Finally, all of the security device uh, advice is as good as the devices that we run it on. So um, you can have that excellent password manager, those excellent shield extensions, X, Y, Z, but if your version of Chrome or Firefox or whatever is out of date, uh, then you still do put yourself at risk and possibly you know, get yourself into a place of frustration where after all of that work, it didn't actually protect you. So that means that you have to update. Uh, you can set your um, devices up to manually update, which is great because it's less to think about in your head. But ultimately, um, your browsers will let you know when there is um, patches available for the software that you're running. It's usually like, for instance, in Chrome, you get that like red um, um, oblong in the right hand corner that just says update. Uh, definitely do click that update button and make sure that that happens because updates contain patches to known security vulnerabilities. And when uh, developers tell you it's time to update, they mean it, and it's for your protection. All right, Martin. Let's talk about some different types of encrypted messaging tools. So remember our model, uh, you know, all of these chat providers and typically read your stuff. Okay, we've gone over this. Now, here's the difference uh, with end-to-end -end encryption. End-to-end -end encryption just means that uh, only the people in conversation can read the message. So even the service provider is not able to decrypt those messages. And this is wonderful because now you can have actually private conversations uh, using tools like Signal and WhatsApp, for example. <laughs> yes, okay. So um, a lot of people think that end-to-end -end encryption is like magic, you know, uh, but I like to show people exactly what it looks like. The print is a little bit small, but this is literally what an end-to-end -end encrypted conversation looks like. And so when Martin said that uh, the service provider, it's, or sorry, yeah, that app that you're using has no visibility into the content. Um, what they have as far as content is concerned is this massive amount of gibberish that if they were to be served with a court order for um, you know, uh, content um, and they couldn't fight that court order and they had to give up the content, this is what they would have to give up, right? Um, because end-to-end -end encryption means that only the computers or the phones or whatever devices on either end of a conversation have the ability to take this gibberish and decrypt it into something legible that we humans can make use of, which is awesome. Um, it's a great technical feat. However, I also like to show this to people because I do want um, to dispel a couple of myths about like what end-to-end -end encryption can and cannot do. You'll notice that in this conversation that is end-to-end -end encrypted, we can still read a couple of things with our own eyes, such as the names of people who are involved. It's me talking to my friend Rose. Um, maybe even avatars if we had them. Um, you'll notice that every single line starts with question mark, OTR colon, and then blah, 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 gibberish. Um, there's also timestamps. So we know that this particular conversation took place at 2.05 p.m. on whichever date that was. And so this is what's called metadata. Um, uh, when we talk to journalists, we actually like to talk to them about this using their own parlance, such as, we know who was talking, we know what, uh, or we don't know what was said, okay, but we know when, we know where, because probably IP addresses are involved, right, and we don't know why, but we do have out of like, you know, the five journalistic questions, we have three of those five just based off of metadata alone. Um, what end-to-end -end encryption does do that is, I guess, a little bit magical is it shifts a balance of power, meaning that if ever um, anyone finds themselves in front of a judge and the judge um, uh, wants to know what Rose and I were talking about at 2.05 p.m. on any particular day, uh, while 
uh, this is what they would have to work with. And perhaps they can surmise what we might have been talking about. But it is now on me or Rose or any, you know, the owner of these devices to provide that what, right? So uh, that's the beauty, but also the limitations of end-to-end -end encryption. And we love when journalists like conceptualize that. So let's talk about some of the different types of end-to-end -end encrypted applications out there. And they all have a lot of trade-offs, um, different considerations around metadata. Um, one that we pretty readily recommend is Signal. Um, Signal is great because not only is it end-to-end -end encrypted, uh, but it's op it's openly developed. So it's developed as an open source project. Anybody can look at the code. This also makes it really easy for uh, third-party auditors to just jump in at any time on their website. They actually have a big list of both formal and informal audits that have taken place over the years. And uh, because that code is so readily available, it's very easy. It's also just a uh, uh, cryptographically quite tight. So it's something that uh, other projects have begun to pick up on. So we, we tend to recommend that. Harla? Yes, I'm here. Um, so an, uh, let's contrast that with uh, something that we like very much called Wire, which also has end-to-end -end encryption. So it's great on our privacy and our ability to maintain confidentiality in a conversation. However, um, even Signal, uh, Signal isn't that popular, but Wire is even less popular. It's very hard to talk to people on Wire because no one is there. Um, and so uh, that actually does make a huge difference based off of the type of conversation that I need to have. If no one is going to be there, um, then it can have the best encryption in the world, but I'm not going to be able to converse with uh, as many people as I'd like to. So, yeah. Yeah. And this matters, right? Um, we want people, Does it? we want, you know, network effects make a difference. Uh, if people are there, we want to, we're more likely to chat there. Um, this brings us to WhatsApp. So WhatsApp uses the same type of encryption as Signal, um, but it is super, super popular. And also because it is owned by Facebook. Meta. meta now. Yeah, Meta now. <laughs> um, because it's owned by Meta, um, we also uh, have seen over the years uh, much a lot of data sharing with Meta. Um, so. For example, a bunch of this uh, metadata eh, uh, is shared with meta. Um, things like uh, contact lists. Um, so that's something that is not shared with Signal by comparison. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also another meta product, Facebook Messenger, also incredibly popular and also does offer end-to-end -end encryption if you enable the secret chats um, within that platform. Also, uh, we don't have this mapped here, but Instagram does the same thing. You can have end-to-end -end encrypted conversations in secret mode, um, but you know, uh, by default, it's not end-to-end -end encrypted. And so uh, that offers a lot of confusion as to how to have a, uh, a confidential conversation because it's not designed to enable you to do so. And of course, it's Facebook. They have your metadata. They know your contacts. They know when you wake up in the morning and go to bed. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Then, of course, we have Slack. Uh, lots of media organizations use Slack. Um, there's basically no privacy expectation on Slack. It's um, nope. everything's read readily available to the service provider. Um, and also, in fact, they uh, they kind of market it as a real benefit to using Slack is uh, how, how you can go back in time and get access to all this stored knowledge within your organization. Uh, the thing to notice is that that information is also, of course, available to Slack. Yeah, and iMessage, I love talking about this. So iMessage is end-to-end -end encrypted, not in the same way as Signal, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Secret Chats, or Wire, not like that. They have their own way of doing it. Um, however, you might notice that uh, if you're an iMessage user, sometimes you have blue bubble friends, and then sometimes you have green bubble friends. And sometimes, uh, you know, like for reasons beyond your control, uh, things turn out to be green bubbles 
Green bubble means you're using SMS messages, which are wildly unsafe. And it usually means that you're talking to somebody on an Android um, rather than talking to someone who's on an iPhone or other Mac device where you can actually pipe your messages through iMessage. Um, and so this design flaw um, can sometimes take people by surprise, thinking that they're having an encrypted conversation, um, but then for a variety of reasons, whoops, it's an SMS message, which is horrible. But yet again, wildly popular. Also, sometimes people back up their, uh, their messages to iCloud, and uh, that can happen on with WhatsApp as well. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Harlow already said it, it's uh, <laughs> SMS messages. Uh, not, not great, not great at all. Uh, and main reason for that is SMS messages, they uh, are not encrypted in the same way as many of these other tools uh, because SMS needs to be interoperable between all kinds of service providers, uh, and many of which uh, also can be a little permissive about how they share data. It's uh, essentially just, you should assume no privacy with SMS messages or very little. No, absolutely no privacy at all forever, like it's wildly unsafe. Telegram <clears throat> also purports to have end-to-end -end encryption. Um, I don't uh, think that they're lying. Um, however, uh, um, prior or uh, in the past, uh, security researchers have been very critical of the way that Telegram implements end-to-end -end encryption, which makes it not as good as any of the other end-to-end -end encrypted options that we'd already talked about. Also, uh, people do not necessarily understand that end-to-end -end encryption is only available in one-to-one -one chats with people. Um, and that means that when you are broadcasting, when you're in a group chat, when you, you know, like uh, using Telegram for a broader purpose with a, a larger number of people, these things are just regular encrypted, like Slack, you know. Um, so that is definitely something to think about. And what is interesting about, you know, things like WhatsApp, Telegram, Facebook, or sorry, Telegram, Facebook Messenger, um, and like even Slack is that uh, there are, there's a incongruity in messaging about what these features are and where they are available and under which context they are un, they are available and that does get people into trouble if they really do rely upon these things for extreme confidentiality so that's just to say if you're using an app like signal or whatsapp that's capable of doing so uh, we can use verification, uh, trust but verify. Um, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these tools, uh, Signal, WhatsApp, uh, I believe Wire has this as well. Uh, they will allow you to check safety numbers. That is, these numbers that are attached to a conversation uh, that you can use to just make sure that your your conversation is properly encrypted. Uh, if your numbers match with your conversational partner. Uh, this means that the conversation is verifiably secured. You can ch check a little box and say, yep, this seems fine. And you can compare these in person, or you could say, do it over a different channel, like uh, over the phone. Uh, but it really needs to be a trusted third-party channel uh, where you know who you're talking to. Uh, there's also the option of disappearing messages. If you're using Signal, you can turn these on by default I like to have disappearing messages set to four weeks by default, and then I can kind of mess with it from there. Um, it's really great uh, for also sharing really short-term secrets. Say if you want to share something embarrassing, <laughs> uh, you can turn that on for 30 seconds and then it uh, disappears. And then of course, there's also group messages. So uh, groups, I think are, there's some compromises with groups in that uh, you can have lots and lots of people in them, some of whom you might not know. And at that point, you know, you really want to trust everybody who's in your group. Uh, otherwise, all the promises of end-to-end -end encryption kind of go out the window. So leaving groups when you no longer need them, always a good idea. Uh, 
we tend to stay away from group links. Um, Signal has these uh, a feature called group links, which allows you to share that link uh, with anybody so that they can join your Signal group. Uh, this, of course, creates a sort of trade-off where uh, maybe strangers try to join your group. So something to be aware of. Uh, and maybe don't share those group links <laughs> if, you, if you don't have to. Um, also, if you do, oops, sorry about that. If you do happen to have people who join your group that uh, seems a little, you know, that seem a little like there's something wrong, um, your group admin, maybe it's you, maybe it's your friend, uh, can kick people out of the group. Um, you can definitely also nominate people to be group admins. Um, another thing about groups, you can always just make another one, <laughs> you know, abandon ones where there's um, situations where there might be too many people or uh, untrusted people in those groups. This app is free. <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot of people take to Signal Desktop, which is really, really great. That said, here are the caveats. Um, these are two different pieces of software, what you have on your phone and what you have on desktop. And so you also need to take care of that desktop environment. Make sure that it is as free from malware as possible. Make sure that you have applied full disk encryption um, if you haven't already. And also do a periodic like audit of um, all of the linked devices that you have associated with your Signal account. And just make sure that you can keep tabs on all of them if you're not using a particular instance of Signal desktop because you don't use that computer anymore or whatever, be, feel free to remove it. It's just keeping things tidy. That's the thing about Signal Desktop, just keep it tidy. Um, here are some cool hacks. Notes to Self is a great alternative to you know, whatever default note app that you might have um, because you have that end-to-end -end encrypted, also like linkable across multiple devices should you choose to do so. Um, uh, Vault that doesn't get synced to your iCloud or you know your Google Drive or whatever it is that you normally have on board. And so this is great for people in the field if they're taking images and video, um, especially knowing that like while it's possible to encrypt your notes on an iPhone, for example, you cannot encrypt notes um, uh, that contain images or video. Um, you can only encrypt text notes. And so this actually gets around that, that particular limitation. And it's really, really great if you're taking sensitive of um, data in the field. What else we have? Okay, so there are uh, features that we come to expect from a variety of messaging apps, such as read receipts and typing indicators, you know, like that, like three dots that, you know, uh, infuriate you because you just want a response and you see someone responding, but then the bubbles go away and then you're like, oh my, can't you just answer the question? You know, like things that make you paranoid, um, <laughs> those things exist, but uh, just know that unlike all of these other apps in Signal, you can turn these things, and also in WhatsApp, you can turn these things on or off depending on your comfort level. I don't really have a security reason why I turn them off. It's really just about my own sanity and your mileage may vary. It's your choice. Um, another choice that you have, which I think is more important is to be deliberate about the degree to which notifications are displayed. And this is where Signal and WhatsApp differ. In Signal, which is awesome, you have the ability to say, um, show me the name and the message um, on that notification bubble, like the thing that pops up, even when your phone is on is entirely locked, you know, um, that notifies you. Or you can just have a bubble that says, so and so sent me a message. You don't know what the message says, you don't have that content, but you do have that metadata as to who is contacting you. Or even more extreme, you can just get a bubble that says you have a message on Signal and you don't know who it's from or what they're saying. Um, and it's up to you to unlock your device and have a look at it in the app. Um, this is important because as much as you know, these tools offer so much security and confidentiality, what happens if you are literally sitting at a restaurant and you have your phone faced up and you know your phone is locked, but then you get a WhatsApp message from you know your source and it's the entire content of that message. Um, someone can see that. A video camera, um, you know, that is installed in the ceiling can record that. Uh, someone can confiscate your phone. They don't even have to unlock it. They can just wait for the bubbles to pop up. 
Um, so these are important choices um, in order to protect your privacy even further. Um, and also some cool extra tips, signal features an in-app image editor. So you can do blurring or um, redactions of any other kind in order to protect um, uh, people in front of your lens before sharing off, um, especially if you're like a mobile first publisher, this can come in very, very handy. And also if you are concerned about either, um, you know, receiving unsolicited media from people you do not trust that could in, uh, contain like wildly inappropriate imagery or could just contain malware or whatever, or just, you know, like suck up your data when you don't have that data to spare. Fiddle with the auto download options in order to prevent that from happening automatically. And it's up to you to literally elect to download and display an image um, onto your app. Uh, WhatsApp also does this one thing that I find kind of irksome is that by default, it will take an image that you've been sent and save it to your camera roll. Thus, what that means is that you are um, uh, having an you have an image that was in an end to end encrypted safe space in WhatsApp, but that is then passed to your on end-to-end -end encrypted camera roll, which could get synced to your iCloud, et cetera. And so this is, once again, this duplication of data from a safe space to an unsafe space that happens by default, which is unfortunate. However, if you do fiddle with your options within WhatsApp, you can prevent that from happening. By default, it does happen. And people are, uh, the vast majority of people that we've trained with are unaware about how to stop that. But I'm telling you that it is possible. All right. Um, finally, or well, not finally, but we have like two more things to talk about. Uh, set a registration lock. This prevents your account from being taken over and used if in the event that you get SIM jacked or you lose, you know, your phone number or something like that, and someone cannot impersonate you and, you know, join all your groups and start chatting again. And also, we do realize that there is currently a, a, a big privacy implication to handing over your phone number to, um, you know, uh, a variety of people in order to find you on WhatsApp or Signal. There are ways to get around it. Signal is easier than WhatsApp. WhatsApp tends to be kind of infuri infuriatingly impossible nowadays, but we can still have that conversation at a later time if you want more options there. Finally, all of this is summarized in an, an article that I put together here. It's uh, called Locking Down Signal. It's on our website, along with a whole bunch of other uh, useful training materials. Uh, we show you how to set a registration pin, uh, mess with those notifications, uh, how to boost your privacy settings, uh, and more. So there's so many there's so many great things that you can do with Signal uh, already by default. But yeah, we show you all the the, the ins and outs, uh, and that's all we've got. Yeah, that's it. So we are at time. Uh, and thank you, um, those of you who could stay with us um, a little bit longer. Uh, but yeah, that was your Digital Security 101 with Freedom of the Press Foundation. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, and we'll kick it off to Ryan to bring us home. Thank you so much, Martin and Harlow. Uh, as Harlow mentioned, we are a little over time. Um, if you do have some questions, uh, I'm happy to act as a conduit. Uh, via email. So just reach out to me, membership at freedom.press, and you can look for this training itself to be uploaded next week. Uh, you all will get emailed the unlisted uh, link. And again, happy to answer any questions you guys have uh, afterwards. Thank you so much for joining us.